Okay, let me uh, uh, let me call to order the meeting of the City of Campbell Planning Commission for May fourteenth, two thousand twenty-four. We have a roll call vote. Commissioner Fields, absent. Commissioner Majewski, Commissioner Ostrowski, absent. Commissioner Gray, here. Commissioner Buckbinder, present. Buster Cancorn, uh, present. Chair Scissor, here. Okay, we have a quorum. Um, my name is Alan Zisser. I'm the chair of the planning commission for the city of Campbell. Um, min uh, minutes. Has anybody had a chance to review the minutes? Are there any uh, changes or I'd like corrections? To, I'd like to, uh, for the, for item three, it's not 68 page, but on page four of the minutes, it says, um, commissioners noted uh, the application was a great improvement from what was previously before the planning commission. That was not a universally shared opinion. Uh, I believe that was Commissioner Gray's opinion, which um, I think I stated. I believe uh, Fields agreed with me that um, he had done nothing of value except waste a year and knock the two units of housing off the project. Um, I also scolded the public to not ask us to try to skirt state law. But the, the statement was uh, it was about an improvement over the first part. Yes. Okay. But what you're talking about is actually something else. I don't think it's an improvement to lose two units of housing later. Okay. Like okay. that was the yeah. I know that a universally shared opinion. Okay. So that was just that, that's fine. That's fine. If we can uh, adjust the minutes to say that. Uh, I don't. I don't. Do you think it was consensus? I I thought it was an improvement. I don't remember everybody's opinion. I don't think it's a straw poll or anything. Um, I'd be happy if it said some commissioner said it was an improvement. Some okay. commissioner yeah, said just say something. Uh, uh, not. Okay. That's all I had. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Was that uh, was that adjustment? Do I have a motion? Yeah, I'll move approval of the minutes as changed for the uh, just as just now changed for the April twenty third meeting. No second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, can we have a vote? Commissioner Majewski? Aye. Commissioner Gray? Aye. Commissioner Bookbinder? Aye. Commissioner Kamkar? Aye. Chair Sister? Aye. Okay, that passes. Um, communications, general modifications. Director Eastwood, do you have any communications, modifications, or postponements to notify us? Sister Planning Commission. One is you have a desk item on five. So you're just, just changing the start time for the plan. And number two, note senior planner Daniel Fama is sick. So senior planner Steve Rose is pitching, you know, I think two or three items. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay, oral requests. I'll open the. For all requests, uh, this is the point in the meeting where any member of the public may address the commission on an item that is not on the agenda. Uh, speaker can speak for up to five minutes, but the planning commission may not take any action today. Is there anybody here in the chamber or online that would like to speak on an item that is not on the agenda? <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'll close that and we'll move on to the meeting agenda. Uh, before we start on the agenda items, uh, I want to provide some information on how we will be conducting the meeting for each item. For each item, I, I, I will first announce the item and then ask for staff presentation, after which the commissioners may have some questions for staff. After that, we will open the public hearing and, and first ask the applicant or representative applicant to speak, followed by any other members of the public who wish to speak. Uh, we'll first have any public speakers physically present and anyone attending via Zoom. Members of the Planning Commission may have questions for the applicant or any of the public speakers. Once we've received all public testimony, we will close the public hearing and the Commission will then have discussion 
and then a motion and decision based on the nature of the item. Um, before we start on the items, commissioners, do we have any disclosures regarding any of the items on the agenda tonight? Uh, I do. For item four, I lived for several years in Franciscan Apartments at 601 Alamarina Drive, and I engaged in an appeal against a rent increase there, which was unsuccessful, at which I left the, um, after which I left the apartment complex and moved elsewhere. Um, I was informed last time that I mentioned that because I have no current relationship with uh, the Franciscan Apartments. I don't need to accuse myself, but I want to make clear that I uh, I used to live there, and I had some disagreements with management. <laughs> Any other, anybody else? No, uh, I, I don't have anything to, to uh, disclose either. Uh, okay, let's start with the first item. Uh, item number two <laughs> um, is 801 West Hamilton Avenue conditional use permit public hearing to consider the request of, of uh, Parvitz uh, Sabi to allow indoor live entertainment to form lies on general alcohol sales associated with an existing restaurant, the Gene restaurant with late night hours, 2 a.m. public closing time, Friday and Saturday. Um, uh, uh, the application under consideration includes a conditional use permit, PLN 2023-182. Staff is recommending that this project be deemed categorically exempt under... CEQA uh, Planning Commission action is final. The recommended action, however, is that the Planning Commission make a motion to continue the public hearing to May 28th. Um, I guess, uh, I guess like, the only question I have is, is what's the reason for that? Uh, we got a little ahead of ourselves, I think, on publishing, noticing this meeting, there were a few loose ends on tying up staff and working. Okay. Um, I'd like to move the let's make the motion. Go ahead. You need to open the public hearing. Oh, I need to open the public hearing. Okay. Okay. Is there anybody in the public that would like to speak on this item? Even though we'll be continuing it, possibly for the next meeting. Anybody may speak though. Okay, nobody? Okay. Is any, nobody on line? Okay. Hey, I can close the public hearing. Oh, I proceed to the motion. Okay, is there, is, uh, do I have a motion? I'd like to make a motion, Chair. Uh, Planning Commission makes motion to continue the public hearing to May 28th, 2024 meeting. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, can I have a vote? Commissioner Majewski? Aye. Commissioner Gray? Aye. Commissioner Goldfinder? Aye. Commissioner Concord? Aye. Chair Cesar? Aye. So that item is continued until the next uh, Planning Commission meeting. Uh, item 3, 2025-2029 Capital Improvement Plan. Public hearing to consider the City of Campbell 2025-2029 Capital Improvement Plan, the CIP for citywide projects for consistency with the Campbell 2040 General Plan. Final number PLN 2024-37. Staff is recommending that the project be deemed exempt under CEQA. Uh, the project planner tonight is Stephen Rose. Thank you. Good evening. Chair Zisser, members of the Planning Commission. So uh, just as a general overview of the purpose of the CIP, uh, so each year the city does prepare a rolling five-year capital improvement plan. It's used in the city to project future capital. The Planning Commission's uh, scope is to review the CIP for consistency with the general plan. And the budget or merit of individual projects is really outside the scope of the Planning Commission's review. With that, I'm not planning on going over every single capital improvement plan project in the report, but I'll highlight the structure. It does provide a project description with, with the, the project name, a project summary, and then on the right, you'll see the actual general plan policies, which that um, project is in furtherance of, could be found consistent with the general plan as a result. And with that, 
staff is recommending that, that the planning commission adopt a resolution finding that the proposed uh, capital improvement plan is consistent with the general plan. And we do have our public works department in the audience available tonight for any questions and finance. <laughs> okay. Uh, questions start with uh, Commissioner Buckleider. Um, I asked a similar question last year. I note that for bike infrastructure, we're putting 65,000 plus 80,000 compared to about $3 million for um, street resurfacing. It's about 5%. Um, in terms of, you know, balancing uses between cars and bikes, this is you know, kind of lopsided. Um, the, the question I had is how we're, we're planning for the next five years here, if I understand it correctly. If we get the sustainable transportation planning grant we're looking for, this means that we will be planning on doing a lot more bike infrastructure around the city. And does this mean that we can't use any of the resurfacing monies for that? Does this mean that our, yeah, uh, for your question, our, we have our city engineer, uh, Emil Lay. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I could have. Would you mind repeating? It was really hard to hear. I'm sorry. Certainly. Um, I noticed that the funding for bike infrastructure is a small portion of street resurfacing funding. The city is currently applying for a sustainable transportation planning grant, which pays for planning, but not implementation. Um, there had been some talk about using the street resurfacing funds to also put together bike infrastructure to build out the plan once we have it. Since we're talking about planning for, you know, five years in advance, does this current plan lock us out of using the street resurfacing funds for adding bike infrastructure five years from now. So the um, annual street maintenance program, I think that's what you're referring to for the street yeah, resurfacing. Tell you which right. Is. So what we do is the primary goal of the street resurfacing and annual street maintenance is to resurface our streets, right? But with that though, uh, we find ourselves having to comply with ADA issues. And so about 30% of that budget goes towards ADA compliance. And so what we also do along with that is that when we are out there resurfacing our streets, we wanna look at our striping. And it's a good opportunity for us to implement bike facilities where there aren't. And if there's enough right of way and enough width, we definitely do consider those. So and a good example is our Hamilton uh, project that we are designing currently that is the annual street resurfacing. It's taking like four years of annual street resurfacing um, money for it, just because it's such a long stretch. So the example there is that we are not just going in and um, redoing the pavement and you know getting a fresh uh, code, new pavement surfacing, but we're looking at opportunities to introduce like complete streets elements. And what I mean by that is looking at areas where um, you know, currently we do have some sort of bike facilities, but we are introducing green bike lanes throughout Hamilton where we can fit it. So it's within the width that we can accommodate. We definitely are looking into that. So through the um, upcoming years for annual street maintenance, that's what we will do um, for every opportunity that we can. If we have street widths, we would incorporate bike facilities in there. So just to clarify, when you say that you add uh, green bike lanes, that's just the paint, right? They're not protected in any way? Um, for, if we have right of way, so Hamlet's in some areas we do, we're introducing buffered bike lanes also. So that's more paint. Like a separation. Like, a, you know, like we have uh, four to six uh, feet and then you have the bike lane. So that's a little buffer. So that's what, that's, those are usually- But there's no buffers. bollards or- concrete. No, no, we just don't have that type of, um, uh, with for that. So if we, I, I guess what I'm asking is if the city's plans change, if we had a citywide bike and pedestrian plan, which encompass that kind of thing, would street resurfacing funds be able to be used for that? We might need to look into other sources because we can't just dedicate all of street resurfacing funds. I guess the primary purpose of street resurfacing annual street maintenance is to resurface our streets. Right. I'm, I'm not talking about re 
moving the whole thing. But incidentally, if you're repaving this street that you would dedicate a uh, oh. portion of it to. So it, it could be used for other infrastructure that's on the street. If it's um, striping and markings, yes. But not bollards or, or curbs or any kind of protection? Uh, we do we do our curb, but if we're looking at more extensive bicycle facilities, we'll need to look at those corridors specifically. Okay, so that would have to come up in a following capital um, a capital plan, following capital plan? Um, perhaps with additional funding. So we'd have to search for additional funding on top sure. of the street. Sure. I mean, it's funny. Okay, thank you. Quite. While you're there, ma'am, let me ask you, uh, and I know I'm straying a little bit from our general plan focus. We usually do on this on this topic because we like to talk about our projects, but mine's actually pretty similar to Mr. Bookbinder. Uh, so you mentioned the Hamilton Avenue uh, project and bike lanes. Now, I, I, in Hamilton, of course, at various points will be in San Jose. Yeah, well, how does Campbell work with San Jose on a project like that, or do you work with San Jose? Or do you just stick to the Campbell? Uh, oh, no, we definitely coordinate. Uh, with our neighboring jurisdictions, so with the Hamilton project on the on both ends, San Jose, and also the expressway intersections with the county. So we're working with both jurisdictions. So with San Jose, what we do is we coordinate and we um, try to sync up as much as we can, and you know find very good transitions. And so we've already shared our plans with San Jose in terms of how we want to expand our bike lanes. You know, and, and that was actually a setup question by me because I live in, in the Moreland West area. And one of the areas that our, our neighborhood association is uh, is uh, concerned about a little bit, I guess, San Jose put in a real nice bike lane, not protected, but a, a, a buffered lane uh, at Santa Masaquino. And it ends at the Campbell uh, borderline where Santa Masaquino then becomes part of Campbell. And from what we've been able to tell, talking with San Jose people, not Campbell people, uh, if that Campbell, uh, San Jose even had a bike lane in on the Campbell side, which isn't there. So I, I just don't, I guess I'm just making my pitch to just say, I wish that Campbell and San Jose were coordinating better on, on Santa Masaquino, where a, a protected bike, or a, a really just a, even a class two bike lane would be a nice improvement. Uh, because there's bicycle school, there's goes to Westmont, there's a middle school. Uh, there's It's a good area there for some coordination that, uh, from what we can tell on our neighborhood association. It hasn't happened. If I could just throw in, that is something really, really good to bring up if we get the sustainable transportation planning grant, but we try and plan the city's bike network to connect to San Jose's network there and connect to schools and, and so forth. So I know that wasn't a question, but I just wanted to make that pitch. But my one quick question that I did see in this, talking about the green paint for the bike lanes. And I think I saw this in here, uh, that the green lanes are supposed to last for 20 years. I didn't know if that meant 20 years between painting or if that just meant structurally. Does that ring a bell with you at all? Or? Well, I don't think the paint lasts 20, years, 20 years on the pavement. Right? Okay, yes. yeah, we, we, we'd repaint it. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Yep. Well, you sure can, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so my interest is in superchargers. Campbell doesn't have any electrical, electric car superchargers that I know of. I know it has, um, uh, I guess, Electrify America, but doesn't have Tesla superchargers. And I was wondering, why not? I mean, Campbell's public like place. I can respond to a bit. Hmm. Robbie, Street Community Development Director. We do have uh, the charge point chargers in a few of the public parking facilities very close to the air. Um, and I'll just acknowledge the Planning Commission. Campbell was approached by Tesla at some time back with a proposal. Uh, I'll say at the time, the um, decision from the administration, city manager, and department heads was to wait a bit for our climate action plan to want a more comprehensive strategy of where we want to put EV charging system and superchargers. So I'd say wait for that process to go forward a bit, and I think we'll be ready to back and talk to Tesla charge plan over EV charging providers on where they could go. But as far as funding for it, you know, shouldn't be plan on funding and so when the action is in place, climate action is in place, that funding can be 
set aside as well rather than at that point saying, okay, now where's the funds going to come from? Sure. Is that something we can do now? Um, to yeah. Well, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, uh, uh, is that something we can do now to set aside funding so when the climate mean, action does happen? Good. It's, yeah, I'll say two things. It's uh, one, don't know the strategy yet. Uh, number two, there are actually a fair amount of grant funds out there floating at the state and federal level on EV charging. You could probably uh, apply for those. Three on Camels, and it is a bit, we're in budget discussions right now, it is a bit of a clean budget year for FY25 due to some increasing costs on the labor rent and some decreases on some of our tax revenue. So the next fiscal year is be a little hard to, to set aside money for that. We did tell the council in our uh, climate action kickoff meeting that would try to front load uh, any grant applications and programs uh, that plug into electrification or areas where we know the climate action plan is going to go. So, so soon. Okay, so thank you for that. And also, um, there are several um, uh, retailers, Target, Whole Food, who are interested, who put these in there parking lot because it attracts the type of customers they want. You know, is that something we can approach where we incentivize them? Yeah, I'd say our best, uh, I mean, those are private decisions between whoever it is, Tesla, Electric Five America, and the retailer or the shopping center owner. The best thing we can do is streamline the permitting process. To my knowledge, uh, we have a very streamlined EV station process. So that's ample Thank you. Thank you. So I just, I just, I just wanted to ask, uh, just to be clear, uh, on the on the page two of five staff report, it's it says uh, new capital projects. So this short list of that adds up to five point eight million. Mm -hmm. Are these projects that were not in the previous year? Yeah, these are new projects to the five-year CIP. So some of these are extension of, these are annual projects, and we're adding the fifth year. Um, this is, there are three this of, is, is this the total CIP? The 5.8 million is the total CIP for the city? That's a total for the new projects. They're just the new projects. Yes, exactly, for the nine new projects. And, and just, you know, for identification for identification on, on on something like the ADA transition plan we get fifty thousand dollars I know there was some more additional detail on that but is that like new money that's come in or is that just money that is being put in from the general fund that's from our capital improvement reserve our CIPR funds so is that like just a continuation because uh, of, of, of last year's that just last year's was 50,000, this year's is 50,000. Good evening. Uh, my name is Norm Wong, uh, Assistant Finance Director. Um, to answer your question, on an annual basis, the city allocates a certain amount of funds from the general fund to the CIPR, as, as may be referenced. Um, and for the ADA transition plan, it's funded solely by CIPR, which comes from the general. That would be uh, like the, the bike and pedestrian would be similar. That be a uh, no, that says exactly. actually that says construction tax and grants. Correct. So the the bike and ped project is funded by construction tax and grants. So that one is not funded by general fund. Okay. All right. Um, anybody else have any, any more questions? Yeah, I have one more. Um, so uh, I noticed there's some budget for the traffic calming program. Are we um, underfunded for that? Are there more requests than we can service, or are we meeting demand? As as far as I'm aware, for traffic calming, we do have that project within our five-year CIP, and there are additional funding within that five-year CIP that are still available and um, not currently utilized. Um, but we do plan to add additional years in the coming future as CIPR funding comes available in the future out years within the five year CIP. Um, but to answer your question, we currently do have that right now. Okay, so there, there's not 
people who are asking for traffic calming and unable to get it. We do get requests and we're um, following the policy. Uh, we have implemented a few projects and actually we have one underway. Um, so I would say that with the current funding, um, it, it seems to be a good level. Okay, thank you. Okay, I just have not, just one more question. Um, just again, kind of from my own notification. Uh, on, on, on any or all of these, are, are these typically subcontracted out or are any of these done by public works? Um, I would say it's a combination. It depends on the specifics of the project. Um, so, so like, for let's say, for example, uh, converting, um, converting curbs to ADA, is that done internally? Is that done by the city or did we contract that kind of thing? Else? For the ADA curb ramps, we contract that out. What, 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 do you know which, which some of, what some of these are done actually by the city? Well, the, according to, for these, these um, nine projects, probably sidewalk curb and gutter improvements is a combination of city staff and uh, contracting a portion of that out. Sure. But the rest I would say is predominantly as contracting the projects out. If it's a, you know, if it's a larger CIP project, it could be that staff does a portion of it, portion of the design and contract some of it out for design services. And then the construction is definitely contracted out. Thank you. If you also have any questions. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, I think that's clarified the, the process for me. Okay. I don't know anything else to add. We need to go into a discussion. Anybody want to have a say specifically in general? I've said my piece. All right. Okay. I guess we can uh, open it up for public open it up for public uh, comments. Anybody either here or online that would like to speak on this item? Yep. Okay. So I'll close public comments. And unless there's commissioners who want to have uh, for the comment, I'll, I'll ask for a motion. Well, I'll move that the uh, Planning Commission of City of Campbell determine the City of Campbell's 2025-2029 Campbell Improvement Plan is consistent with the Campbell 2040 General Plan. Second. A second. We have a second. We have a vote. Commissioner Majewski? Aye. Commissioner Graham? Aye. Commissioner Bookminder? Aye. Commissioner Concord? Aye. Chair Susan? Aye. That's is unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Chokes and Finance Department. I stand up both. Okay, next item. Uh, item four, 601 Al Almerida Drive, extension of time, public hearing to consider the request of Rain Tree Capital LLC to extend the approval period of a previously approved site and architectural review permit with a density bonus tree removal, tree removal permit that allowed the construction construction of a three story 60 unit apartment building within the existing 180 unit apartment community, the Franciscan, located at 601 Almerida Drive for uh, an extension of time for an additional two years. Uh, the file number is PLN 2024-44. Staff is recommending this project be deemed categorically exempt under CEQA. Planning Commission action is final unless appealed. I'm writing to the city clerk within 10 calendar days. Uh, Stephen. Thank you again, Chair Zisser and members of the Planning Commission. So this is a request, as just mentioned, for a two-year extension of approval for a 60-unit apartment building within a, an existing 180-unit apartment community. The request for the two-year extension has been made in response to adverse market conditions, which have been noted by higher interest rates and challenging lending requirements. 
And with that, staff is recommending the planning commission adopt a resolution, make the extension of time request. That concludes staff's presentation. Um, so that's when, when we ask, have questions, Mr. Majewski, do you have any questions? Um, I am wondering what kind of staff resources go into this and is there a reason or can't, is it beneficial to the city to, or is it possible to adopt something like the proposed SB 937 so we can like make this ministerial? I don't know if I'm using the right to go, but. So to take a citywide action to extend all approvals would require a legislative act of the city council. So we'd have to present an item. Um, just before you, we don't have that many pending projects which would likely warrant the staff time and commitment to do so. I, I think what Daniel is, it was indicating in the report is that there is pending legislation just recognizing similar market conditions and challenges facing projects that are you know faced by this project as well. It just didn't happen to line up with this particular project window. If that legislation passes, it would also render such a motion like an action moot. Because if the council were to take an action that is also being subsumed by state law, and it could cause some degree of confusion with applicants and, and the applicability. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Craig. Last. Commissioner Buckley. Um, I guess, are we confident that uh, it's going to get built next time? Or are we just waiting on interest rates to change? If they do get built, if it doesn't get built. If I could borrow your map, your crystal ball, as well as the belt. I mean, essentially, if, if the market conditions persist, it's just like we're seeing now the higher interest rates and difficult securing lending requirements. Presumption would be that those conditions would also continue to preclude the construction of the project. We all hope that they'll, they'll improve and provide an opportunity for the project to get built. Okay. Thank you, Chip. Um, so I, I mean, I would be, um, I, w I was likely to go along and say, yeah, it's a good idea. That makes sense. The condition until I saw this statement on in attachment B, which is page, page 56 of our pamphlet of our Thing, but it would be attachment B, page three of six. Third paragraph, which is in the middle of the paragraph number three, which is in the middle of the page. Um, so there was some, uh, I guess, density bonus calculation, 35% density bonus calculation, and the number came out to 70.7. .7, and it said rounded up to 71. And I'm like, what? rounded up. I thought Campbell doesn't round up. They always round down. And when I saw this, then I'm definitely for this project because I think it's going in the right direction with rounding up. So I just wanted to, um, I just want to show I'm seeing this right. I'm posting it as a question. So I get chastised by the chair. Is this, <laughs> any, is that, am I seeing this right? You are seeing it correct. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Let the records show. Okay, we round up. Appreciate it. Um, uh, you know, it's it just, I think we're all disappointed that this isn't something that can go ahead. Any of these projects that we've approved, you know, we've approved this project. And um, uh, it was uh, good to go. Um, uh, after two more years, after the extension of two years, then there's a question of whether we extend it again or we ask them to reapply, right? Correct. <laughs> Thank you for the concise answer. Um, uh, do, do we have no, there, there is real no choice here, right? I mean, we, we can either deny the extension and then it, it will then require them at some point in time to reapply, or we can just give them the extension. And I suppose clarification would be that the applicant still has their remaining window to get an issued building permit, but the likelihood of that occurring is nil. What's, what's the window at this point? I think it was until May of next year. No, 
uh, I think it later, like oh, so an hour and a half ago. <laughs> oh, so yeah, exactly. So we're giving him an extension. Another, with, so there's there's two. It's going to be another two years. Correct. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Do, um, can I ask something about the project? Just as a, since it's in the agenda, the whole description of the project. Um, just for future reference, I guess when it show up. <laughs> um, uh, the 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 new item, the new. And then I guess clarification from uh, and, a, and the other commissioners. So the the, the additional sixty units, which could be a multi-story building, the twenty are going to be affordable, right? Twenty, which is correct, a nice number. Um, but there are already one hundred eighty units in in this in the forensics. Are any of the existing units affordable? So at the time of this development request having been made, because they were exercising state density bonus law, all existing units are kind of encapsulated within that original calculation, which is where you're getting to that number. Yes. Because the apartment community, they, they do not have any deed restricted units. So the typical traditional understanding of an affordable unit, there are none. But state density bonus law also requires one to consider existing rates, rental rates, or occupants, which are at lower income levels and absent five-year uh, rental roles of their community, they were essentially imposed a requirement that they needed to have an assumption of affordability, which is kind of why you're seeing the, the, the percentage allocated to this project being higher. Being higher. Okay. Okay. It kind of makes it up for it. Okay. All right. I, I, anybody else have any more questions? Um, uh, let's see where are we? Uh, I'm trying to ask my question. Um, we open this up again. We open this up for. Uh, uh, we open this, open this up for public uh, comment. We, uh, anybody who wants to speak publicly on this item, here or online, please come forward. Could you uh, turn that on? Hit the white. And, and it's a circular thing. Yeah, it, it, the white, the white side. Still true. Yeah. And, and, and state your name and. Hello, uh -oh. everyone. Um, so my name is Alan Chuang with Rain Tree Partners. Uh, we're the applicant. Uh, worked with Steve Rose on this project years ago. Uh, and I just wanted to say that we, we kind of voiced the same frustrations not being able to uh, progress this project further, uh, to the point that it is now. Unfortunately, mainly due to market conditions, like Stephen had mentioned in his presentation. Uh, I did want to reemphasize that we are long-term holders, investors, in all of our portfolio assets, Francis Gibney, one of them. Uh, we bought this project back in 2017. We invested a heavy amount of capital into it, existing um, community. And, you know, it's a matter of when, not if, uh, when we build this project, uh, we've continued to retain the whole design team, uh, continue to keep our pulse in the market to get a you know, better understanding of when we could move this project forward. So, again, um, just want to reemphasize that you know, we do plan on doing this project. Thank you very much. I have a question. Have a question. So, as you let's say this happens again and again, and let's say three, four times, sometimes the code changes by then. You know, that's one of the risks. Run or let's say solar panels becomes a requirement, and all oh, electric becomes a requirement. Um, uh, how how would that be handled? You know, do you go and change the plans to make sure they're up to code, or are you vested with the code that you got approved? With? From my understanding, we are vested based off of one plans were titled, so I believe this is based off of twenty twenty nineteen code. Say, uh, so I guess we would have to work with staff to understand. Well, for some reason, in the next two years, we don't progress this project. What our options are. Right. I will say uh, we did submit our plan, our first round of plan checks back in 2022, but again, a lot has changed since then. Uh, so we are committed again. Uh, it's just not. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have questions for Apple? These are. Any of the things, so it seems like this project like just barely penciled and then the economic condition changed and it didn't and change again, it might again. Um, are there any particular restrictions that the city put on it or rules that we have in place that made it so it just barely penciled 
or is that just the nature of the construction market at this point? Yeah, I wouldn't say just barely penciled, uh, but yeah, the city's been very cooperative uh, working with Stephen, of course, with COVID uh, during the whole time here. The city's been very helpful. Uh, they haven't given any restrictions for us. Well, when I say just barely penciled, I mean it's the interest rates change and now it doesn't. Yeah, well, it's a combination of interest rates um, increasing and construction costs continue to increase as we can see. Fortunately, I think we are seeing a slowdown, but we haven't seen any decrease just yet. Uh, so, you know, those two factors really have, uh, have been this project challenging move forward. Thank you for trying it. Hopefully, we'll see it move forward. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. Nobody else? Okay, I'm going to close public hearing. Um, any of the commissioners really want to make comments on this? Uh, I guess I appreciate the word liberalized development, but like, boy, it feels like we really wasted those years when interest rates were lower and money flowed freely, and we just wanted to be real careful with everything. We were real careful, and we didn't build much, and now it's hard to build things. Darn. Great. <laughs> Well, no, obviously we're all frustrated. I, I don't think there's too much we can do here. We want, we want project and, you know, those 20, uh, those are VLI units, not just LI units. So that's a big plus for the city. So hopefully it'll happen and we'll all open it, so. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, so if the opportunity becomes to build some of the units, maybe not all of it, you know, um, that's better than none of the units you know so uh you know i know money's tight you know maybe money's tight to build all of them all 60 but maybe 20 can go forward you know so if that becomes a possibility we should you know that is progress for us so thank you well just just to respond to your comments it, it's a it's a multi-story building with 60 units in the middle so I, it, it's not a bunch of individual it's my understanding so it's not like the existing facility where they have multiple groups of buildings it's it's this one new building that's going to be up in the middle that's going to have so it's a three three or four story building that has 60 units kind of hard to do a partial on that um i'm i'm just you know I mean, yeah. If they could, if they could, if they downsize it, and if it needs, uh, it could, it can pencil out. I, I, I'm sure that they would look at that. But uh, my take is on, uh, as I said, that it's, uh, uh, you know, it's like uh, this was a, a, a going to be a nice, uh, a nice item, and uh, I think people were looking forward to. We hope that interest rates go down soon. We can write letters to the Fed or whatever. <laughs> And uh, we can hope that maybe it'll happen sooner than the two years extension. So, um, uh, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to have it here. To adopt a revolution, a resolution, uh, referencing attachment A, approving an extension of time request to extend the approval period of previously approved site and architectural review permit with a density bonus and tree removal permit for a period of two, two years. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Can we take a vote? Mr. Majewski? Aye. Commissioner Craig? Aye. Commissioner Bookbinder? Aye. Commissioner Catcourt? Aye. Commissioner Sip? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Stephen. We have concise new business. New business amending the start time of the planning commission to 7 p.m. Planning commission consideration of resolution amending the start time of regular scheduled public meetings to 7 p.m. PLN 2024-72. Um, the recommended action is to move it to 7 p.m. Um, this, there's not a staff presentation on this, right? <laughs> uh, Commissioner Majewski, would you like to? Uh, 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 comment on 
uh, this. Um, I'd, love, I'd love to be home a little earlier and help the staff get back to their home, especially earlier, because they're here for the days. All right, so your favorite. Commissioner uh, Craig. I, yeah, I'm all in favor. Strongly. Commissioner Buckbanker. I'm all for it. Okay. You should have been. I am. Hey, you know, I I'm uh I have no stake, really very little stake on this. I'm 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 retired. I have no children or a full time job. And to me it's like if if the commissioners that have more um things to deal with, uh, I, I'm I'll go a gong with the majority. It's fine with me, and uh, hopefully it'll make it better for the staff. I don't, I, I don't know. You guys work late, no matter what it seems. So, <laughs> so um, you have to open a public hearing now. I don't know. Do we? It, there, this is a, this is a new business item. I, I don't know. We there's no public hearing. On this. No, I don't know. Well, okay. Why, why don't we? Why don't we just open up public hearing? Is there's anybody who? Who's the comment on this? Might be nobody opposed or favored. Nobody. Okay, we'll close. We'll close that, and I'll make a motion that the planning commission adopt the resolution amending the starting time of the regularly scheduled public hearings to 7 p.m. beginning June 11th. Is that incorporating the language of the desk guide? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, incorporating the language of the desk guide. I'm going to us by email. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Kamkar. We have a vote. Commissioner Majuski. Aye. Commissioner Curry. Aye. Commissioner Bogart. Aye. Commissioner Kamkar. Aye. Commissioner Aye. Okay, that's unanimous. So starting in the first meeting of June, we'll be at 7 p.m. Yeah. Just a quick note on SARC is Vice Chair Kamkar. Yes. yes. Okay. And yeah, just about if there are short items, I think we'll try and hold six thirty. If there are long items, we'll start six. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Sounds good. Uh, study session. Housing legislation update. Study session discussing the key legislation in case law pertaining to the development of housing projects. Recommended action the planning commission to receive the report and seek clarification from staff as necessary. Um, who's going to do this? Stephen? Thank you again, Chair. So, the purpose of this tonight's study session is to provide an update and overview of recent state legislation and case law. It's also serving to educate the planning commission on the impact of these laws and implementation. I'll also just add that there's a whole world of legislation related to housing development. We didn't focus today's study session on items which are in the report. Uh, if it's if the planning commission has interest, we could possibly re we, we do intend on doing uh, updates on legislation in the future. So there will be opportunities for future other bills and discussion items as well. So with that, um, the first item which we discussed in the study session is state density bonus law. Uh, just kind of capturing the key sound bites of these two uh, court cases where the Schreiber versus City of Los Angeles had determined that uh, concessions are no longer required to demonstrate that they lead to cost reductions. Historically, state density bonus law said if you have a concession, you need to indicate exactly how and to what cost benefit that we'll have is usually requiring cities to impose a requirement for what's called a pro forma. So that you're saying, yes, I do need this concession. I need to have an additional story added in my building. How does adding the story make sense for a concession? Well, now we can no longer ask that question on how that adding a story results in cost reduction, for example. Not to say that you'd use a concession that way, you'd probably use a waiver for separate discussions. Um, Banker Hill 150 versus City of San Diego. This is probably the most significant one and prob probably the primary driver of tonight's study session is it it established that developers are now entitled to to use to waive all development standards even objective standards that would prevent a project from being built as designed this is to say that if you have any standard height setback um, design requirements material requirements a developer may use an unlimited number of waivers on the project by just merely by 
qualifying as a state density bonus project to alleviate those requirements of that project. It's exceedingly powerful. Uh, this court case um, does up it has major upheaval on our kind of our understanding of the application of standards. This is why we're presenting it before you with actually a couple a number of case studies. Uh, some of these are presented in the report, but I'm trying to keep it fresh. I provided uh, kind of a new take on some of them, so you guys have to follow along. Uh, case study number one. Uh, so, say for example, a state density bonus project has requested the city to grant a waiver to eliminate parking requirements. So in this particular case, it would not be applicable. And the reason for that is that state density bonus law already establishes minimum parking standards, which may not be lowered further by exercise of a waiver. There are, of course, other laws, as, we've talked, as I believe we've discussed in the past, AB 2097, which do allow for elimination of all parking requirements for a major portion of the city, like nearly, I'd say three, nearly two, two fourths of the city, like half the city. Uh, is already eliminated from parking, so it's largely moot. I just want to emphasize this as an example of where a waiver would be eligible. You could push it down any further. What state density bonus law already allows if you're outside one of those, you know, parking reduction areas. Uh, as another case study, a uh, density bonus project comes forward and, and requests the city to grant a waiver to eliminate the city setback requirements. Could this be allowed by state density bonus law? Yes. Even if a city's development standard is objective, a waiver may be used to alleviate the requirement if it would present, prevent the project from being built as designed. Use that quote again. So this city's new multifamily development design standards, they do include setback standards like our traditional code had. Also has standards such as adjacency requirements, like where you're abutting single family to kind of, what we're trying to hopefully achieve is prevent that looming building from being up against a single family home. Unfortunately, what this is telling us is that state density bonus law, through use of waivers for which there is an unlimited number, could alleviate, could, could alleviate a product of those requirements. Uh, third and final case study, a state density bonus project require, requests the city to grant a waiver to remove on-site trees, including tree species and sizes that are protected by the city's pre tree preservation ordinance. For example, you've got a grove of redwood oak, cedar or ash trees in the property, all of a sufficient size. City's requirement to, to retain those trees does constitute a development standard, which is also subject to a waiver. So the developer could request to summarily to remove the trees to allow for the project to occur. So um, we can stop as a suggestion to the, to the chair after each section, or I can just wrap up the presentation when we revisit each topic. We're going to go over the streamlining process. Correct. So next up is SB 684, which I'll be happy to cover now. So this is one of two bills which will be effective July 1st, 2024, which is up and coming. Staff is looking at preparing an interim or urgency ordinance, which would go to for City Council in June of this year, just before the effective date. Uh, it's our intention to establish these temporary standards to facilitate these projects until such time more permanent and comprehensive standards can be rolled into our city's multifamily development design standards. It's part of a broader and more comprehensive update we're working on at this time. So, if the project comes in while well, this urgency uh, urgency requirements are in, what you know, how how does staff handle it? So the the urgency ordinance will actually serve that very function. It'll provide guidelines and parameters for how this project will be handled. By and large, as I'll probably cover in the next couple slides, SB 684 prevents the city from establishing unique or specific development standards by virtue of a project exercising 684. So the urgency ordinance is largely just serving to codify to provide guidance to staff and to the public as to how, how to kind of take in a project and what the rules really are. So they understand how it relates to our other codes and standards and understanding which of those are being preempted by this law. So that I'll, I wanted to highlight, I, I'm not going to go over every single bullet point um, in the study session, but I did want to kind of highlight those which are yellow here on the screen. I think these are kind of the more interesting or apply to 99% of the SB 684 projects. 
So really to qualify, the, the site first and foremost has to be zoned for multifamily residential development. And the project itself has to occur, it has to result in less than or equal to 10 lots. And also the same for uh, 10, less than or equal to 10 units. Um, there are other kind of extenuating circumstances that apply about the type of units or things on the site which might be demolished. But more likely than not, a, a challenge for some to try to exercise this law is that the site cannot have units which are occupied by tenants in the last five years. Uh, in terms of density requirements, so although we, we have density ranges established for several of our multifamily develop, uh, multifamily land use designations in the city, it does provide kind of an override provision saying that it not was, notwithstanding whatever your land use designation says, say it's capped at a certain amount, you could go up to 30 units per gross acre, say you're going to 30 units the acre. There are exceptions to that, which is really kind of based on whether or not the site is designated as a housing opportunity site. So the city designated, uh, I think, around 100 sites as part of the housing element update. If a site is designated, shown on that map, as a housing opportunity site, the project has to also result in at least as many total units and as many low and very low income units as had been projected by the housing element for the parcel. If the site is not designated, on the housing opportunity site map. The product must result in at least as many units as the maximum allowable density of the parcel. So these are kind of like combining factors. So you're saying in some sorts of situations, less than 30 is great, but that doesn't mean you go down to zero. It means that if, if, if the housing element with the general plan land use designation allowed up to five, six, 10 units on that site, you must minimally build that many in order to comply. And then on the affordability side, each of the sites in the housing element were assigned a, a presumption on the number of very low, low and moderate, and even above moderate income units on those sites. They must result in at least as many of the low and very low income units as projected by the housing element. Uh, just in terms of development standards, um, again, kind of cherry picking from the list here, uh, it, you cannot prohibit lots which are 600 square feet or larger, so it's getting 600 square foot is really the floor now. Um, you have to allow for a result for projects with three to seven units of 1.0 in terms of FAR, and projects with eight to 10 units would be permitted at a floor area ratio of 1.25. In terms of parking standards, um, admit, uh, the city may not require more than one space per unit. Of course, our circumstances were less than that, like zero, would come into play kind of like where AB 2097 is, but also unique to SB 684, it also extends it to uh, that, that allowance to also include any site within one block of a car share vehicle. Um, in terms of setbacks, the city may not impose side or rear setbacks, which are greater than four feet from the original lot lines is the boundaries of the site as it exists today, not between lots which are created by the bill. So it really any setback between buildings on a site, so you could have attached units, that's okay. So long as, except as maybe otherwise accepted by the building code, if you have windows or other types of openings, you need to comply with building and safety requirements. Sorry, uh, so this slide should be titled, so I'm moving on to SB4 now, right? It looks like I have a title here. If you have questions, we ask yeah, that certainly. One. Can you go up the... Oh, three slides up. Uh, you said the site, the uh, one of the requirements was up to 10 units and then up to 10 lots. So my point in all is, is it possible for there to be, let's say, five lots, but 10 units total? So two lots per unit, is that a possibility? Yes, that would be possible. And then because it's more than seven, let's say there are 10, 10 units, not the um, FA bar has to be 1.25 or it could be up to 1.25. That That is a, an it's an up to allow. So I'm trying to get the screen to share here as well. I think it means that we as the city cannot cap it at anything below 1.25. Got it, got it. Okay. And then the other, um, the other thing you said about there has to be as many units above market share as below market rate. Um, can you clarify that a little bit? 
So that, that is a provision which is unique to, sorry, I'm about to jump to the slides here again. Uh, so if the site is a designated housing opportunity site, get to that slide real quickly. So this is the slide which, which brings up that point. So if you are a designated housing opportunity site, the housing element in our opportunity sites had certain assumptions that went to each of them that they were assigned a certain, number, a certain number of very low or low income units. So some, in some cases, you could be assigned several uh, low income units if you were a designated housing opportunity site, in which case your project must provide those deed restricted, very low or low income units as part of the project. Even even in 684. Even under 684, if it's a designated housing operating site. If you're not designated, you only need to result in as many units as the maximum allowable density would provide for. With the market rate or not. With Correct. The lower of a okay. Correct. Now, of course, those projects too would be subject to the city's inclusionary ordinance if they were, say, building 10 units or as amended as part of the city's upcoming inclusionary ordinance update and nexus study looking at possibly lowering that threshold of compliance, that could apply a different type of affordability requirement on projects, say, greater than five units. So right now, if if a project came in at, with 684 at 10 units, do any of them have to be affordable? Or, I guess... 15% of them would still be subject to the city's inclusionary ordinance. So that would be two of the 10 units as rounded. So we're rounding up again. Correct. Okay. And if there's nine, then probably, then then you have to provide one. Because fifteen percent of nine is less than one point five. And... I believe that also rounds up to two. Oh, it's not still. Oh no! Well, at nine, well, uh, under the current inclusionary ordinance, it's not a question question we'd answer, because it's not subject to the requirement. So the, the, the inclusion ordinance, as it's written at this exact moment in time, triggers at 10. And probably, and again, by the effective date, so there will be a window of time where the, that the interim ordinance will be in effect after the effective date of July 1st, where our new inclusionary ordinance and provisions that kind of lower the threshold will not be in force in effect, which will be, so again, there will be a window where nine unit projects would not be subject to any affordability requirement. Because because currently it's ten or more. Correct. Okay. Hey, can we can you just finish do the SP four and then we'll just go back and see if anybody else questions on the other stuff. Certainly. Okay, SP SP four. Try to delete half of that. I was getting there. Um, so again, it has an effective date similar to SP uh, six eighty four which is uh, July 1st, 2024. Similarly, staff is planning on pr present a interim ordinance before council in June. And again, just like SB 684, we're looking at having permanent standards to be reflected as part of the, a more comprehensive update to the city's multifamily development design standards. Uh, on the screen here, and I, I didn't mention on the pro previous slide, this is just showing possible properties. It's not to say every single one of these properties will be included in SB 4. But it's it generally it's sites which are institution are owned by religious institutions or higher education sites. It's a kind of a complicated exercise because we need to determine if each site individually um, is tax exempt and meet other requirements of ownership. But it's kind of showing a, like a in a mass view the, the potential impact of the bill. Uh, again, just cherry picking parts from the report, which I thought were more. Uh, apropos here, um, in terms of the property itself, it must be land owned on or before January 1st of 2024 by a qualifying faith-based or higher educational institution. So this is to say religious institutions couldn't just go buying up properties but exercise this bill today. If they already own the property, then those properties could qualify. There is a, an affordability requirement for these projects. They have to be 100% affordable. Uh, in terms of density, it allows for in it when it when again when it's in a zone which allows for residential uses, it would allow for a density allowed by the land use designation of the properties of the city's designated 40, it would allow 40 or 30 units per gross acre, whichever is the greater. And then if it's located in a zone which does not allow residential uses, so say the city has a 
public facilities designation for the property or some other designation which does not allow residential development, the city has to allow for the greater of the density allowed on the parcel or on an adjoining parcel uh, or a, a, a 40 units per acre. So you have to allow for the density allowed on an adjoining parcel or 40 units per acre is probably a better way of saying that. Question. Is there, they have to be 100% below market rate. Can they stack in density bonus with this? You can combine state density bonus law with SB4. So the actual density allowed is going to be some multiple of that? Right. It, 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 yeah. You could, you could do up to 100% density bonus under the new state density bonus law. So you could double that. And there are also possible other ways of getting density, four units on top of that as well. So 40 becomes a 80 units to the AQ. If they were to do a, yeah, 100% affordable housing development project could qualify. Now, granted, their affordability uh, provisions of SB4 only require, it says, it essentially allows 20% of the units to be modern. I'd have to look at exactly the tables, see how you combine, because uh, there's, a, there's a standard table for state density bonus law, which gets you AFAR. And then in order to get the state double density bonus, which could get you up to 100%, you have to kind of combine across income categories. So exactly how that reconciles with 20% moderate allowance allowed by us before, I'd have to look at. But yes, conceivably it's possible if they provided a low enough level of affordability, they could double the densities provided by the building. It actually specifically allows for it. Great question. Um, sorry for all these title slides. I must miss something there. <laughs> this is all SB4, just to reiterate. Um, again, on kind of interesting points and in development standards. So it does allow for the greater of one story above the maximum building height allowed on the parcel or the maximum building height allowed on an adjoining parcel. So you kind of have to look at what the, so if we have a, a housing, a, if we have a religious institution, which happens to be right next to one of our transit oriented sites, which allows up to 75 feet in height, it would allow for it to mimic that same height. If so, if a, a religious institution was ever so old as to build a tower of that height. It's not out of the question, but but I think one of my but, but on the other side is if 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 the if there's a, a church in a residential neighborhood with where the adjacent are are no more than two story. In which case it would not advantage them. So they would be kind of more or less following what the allowable height of uh, plus one story mm -hmm. would, would so uh, you know one of the churches in the, in the in a residential district that has extra land and they can't necessarily put up a, uh, an eight story bill if there's only story correct they couldn't they couldn't use the, the height of the adjoining parcel to benefit them in that situation so if um people who bought who built or owned wesley manor building adjacent to that wesley manor is currently higher than 75 feet so they can build the city down so Maximum building height allowed in an adjoining parcel that would not advantage them because they could build as high as the existing. I guess I'm saying, could they use that to exceed our height limit if an existing building exceeded our height limit? Because it says maximum building height allowed. Is that the actual legal language or is the maximum building or the existing building height? I believe that the that the that the intent to ask before is to say that based on the development series that has the exist today. So if that building were to go away, what is allowed, it'd be like say five story tall building on that site. So it, in which case you'd only be allowed what is currently allowed under our current codes and standards. Okay. But if the parcel happened to be in a transit oriented neighborhood where we allowed a 75 foot height limit, they could get one story above that and they could exceed our height limit. Correct. Okay. Uh, so just moving down here on the slide, uh, use requirements is kind of interesting. So obviously, SB4 is allowing you to have residential uses on sites where it may otherwise not be permissible. Uh, it goes on to say religious institutional uses or any use previously existing or legally permitted could be allowed. And then it also goes on to allow for these, this introduces a concept of in ancillary uses. Uh, these are uses which would be permitted on the ground floor of any type of new building, which is proposed, which in a, if the site has a single family residential zoning designation or a single family zone, it would allow child care centers and facilities operated by community-based organizations to be that ground floor. 
But if it's in an other zone, so which meaning if you're in a commercial zone or somewhere else of the city, you would allow those commercial uses which would be permitted by that zone, but without a conditional use permit. So it would bypass the conditional use permit requirements. In the, in the particular case of the city, it'd be both our administrative conditional use permit and also our conditional use permit processes. That's just a, that's an example. Uh, there are a few additional requirements of SB4. Um, most notably, projects which utilize this bill must pay prevailing wage, which is served as a barrier to some in developing projects under some of these bills. Um, just to give them the current financial markets and difficulty financing, as we heard earlier tonight. Uh, you also must satisfy parking requirements as outlined in the bill, which really speak to a minimum of one, who allows for uh, as few as one space per unit. And again, except in those circumstances where you're near ride share or public transit, in those circumstances, no parking could be imposed by the city. And with that, that brings us actually to the end of the presentation. So okay. I'm available for any questions that you may have. Why are you asking? We can we go back to uh, the last questions when we started the the earlier items, and then just work our way through. If anybody has any uh, questions. I'm just, you know, let's let's not worry about going down the line. Let's, let's just, uh, if anybody has a question about the uh, the the what's the, what's the first one, the um, uh, the the state density bonus loss stuff. I mean, you know, I'm, I have a question about, you know, the objective standards thing, obviously that like it, it, it sounds to me like it basically, maybe we don't need to be planning commissioners anymore. I, 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 <laughs> it's like we can meet once every six months. Uh, it, it, it sounds to me like this case, unless it's uh, challenged that uh, objective standards go out the window and and the uh, I guess the question I have is you know the thing I wrote down was the as design, the as design thing is the developer comes up with the design, and submits it, that's the as design, is that correct? That, that's so, correct. So I'll respond, and I just want to make sure the planning commission understands that it's a super important point. So before the developer would have to look at our standards and say here's where I need to be from your standards, this flips the script. A developer could come in and I've used this as a staff, propose a gigantic ball or any shape you could think of. Say, I have a vision of this as my design and I've designed it and your standards don't conform to it. So I'm asking for waivers from your standards because it does not meet my design. So I just want to make sure that's a very important point that came out of this case that to Chair Zisser's point, well, the city spent two years establishing objective standards because uh, we wanted to set the, the table for what residential development should look like. The project comes in and uses density bonus. In effect, if, if the objective standards prevent them from meeting something that they want to design themselves, they can use the waivers uh, to do that. And as a frustrated attorney, I would point out that that as designed language is nowhere in the statute. Uh, the statute basically says that uh, they are entitled to a waiver from standards that would prevent them from uh, building the building at the with the affordable units that they are requesting. Doesn't talk about as designed at all, but well, I'm confused. Where is, the, where is the as designed language? It's where from the case. case. That is, the way the, that is the way the, yes, the court interpreted That's the, way the, the court statute. Interpreted. Oh, well. Yeah, I could add a little bit more. I mean, City of San Diego had actually requested that the case not be published, I believe, because they didn't, although they, the case was actually favorable, I think, to the City of San Diego's decision to approve the project. They didn't want it published for this very reason, because of the, the as design language coming out of it. I would mention also, though, that although we have these objective development design standards, 
And although that they are, because of this law and the current court case and law environments preempted, we still will have them be applicable to non-state density bonus law projects. So whenever somebody comes up with a standard project, market rate project, they still have force and effect. Um, I do have a question regarding 684 in case we're done with state density bonus. I don't know if anybody else has any questions on the uh, state density bonus. Uh, just got a mini, mini question, okay. just on a real small item, it just really struck me as surprising. Uh, and because we've done a lot, we have a lot of tree removal appeals that have come before the planning commission over the years, and those are always tough cases. The city has a pretty good coordinates on saving just certain couple of main types of trees, you know, ash, oak, forget how many of the other ones. But so I guess my surprise is, Stephen, when you t when you say that the tree preservation is a design element, isn't that a, an ecological uh, desire of the city rather than a design element. So I'll, 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 I'll get started. Um, we, we can tilt there. <laughs> so I, I, it, it is a requirement that you preserve or protect trees on site when they're redwood, oak, cedar, and ash, and certain findings are met or established. So it's a form of development requirement on a project. Now, the city, there are findings for when a concession or waiver may be denied, but the bar is so incredibly high, the city would need to, if they were to take an argument of an ecological impact or otherwise, we would need to establish in the record of, with a preponderance of findings and evidence that the removal of those particular trees would cause such an adverse health and safety impact for which there is no satisfiable mitigation measure that may be imposed on the project, like replacement of the of different trees on the property that could offset that impact. In order for the city to make such a determination for denial, they would need to, we would practically need to have those studies and those up front, and they, they would already need to be established. So it would be exceedingly difficult for the city to deny those trees which are being requested for removal. So it is a form of development requirement, just to reiterate, and it would be very challenging to deny that request. And and, that, and and the whole the whole tree code, it, it, that's just our local requirement. This is it's not backstopped up by some state level environmental protection stuff. It, it, it is not. I mean, there are there is still CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act still is in play. And if those trees happen to be habitat to raptors or hummingbirds, there might be in position of conditions of approval that during the bird nesting season, those trees may not be removed or it might be, but as far as mitigation, those would be examples of, there are circumstances where there are mitigating measures, which may be imposed on the project to lessen the impact of that to a less than significant level. That'd be tough to, in, in a typical neighborhood, unless it's like adjacent to a creek or something like that, right? And, and, that, even, and even that. Even that. <laughs> else on this section? Okay, why don't we move to 684. Um, I, I'll start because, you know, when I read it, this was, I was going, oh, it's, you know, 10 or fewer units, but then, um, then it's like, then I see the under five acres and I'm going, well, 10 or fewer eight units uh, and under five acres seem to judge. So I guess my question is, this has a bigger impact potentially. Uh, tell me if it has a bigger impact potentially than for what we typically have seen in terms of a small development on a, on a, on a, on a one or two parcels, you know, like on Union Avenue where we built eight units on, on an empty parcel. Um, it, does this have implications for bigger acreages where they are subdivided? I, I don't understand the overall implication for um, more than, for, you know, other than for less than two units, 10 units. Yeah. You have a comment, question, 
or Nick, you're going to recess? Oh, you want to take that too? Yeah. Take it. Sure. Good idea. Uh, We're good, Al. Yeah, we can start again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your patience. Uh, are you good? No. Okay, Stephen. So I, 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 I'm, I'm just, you know not clear on on this it's like my first read is okay it's just for for where there's less than 10 minutes or less but then you see five acres you see 10 watts you see the the, the numbers explain to me how this does this really have a, a bigger impact on bigger developments so it could um we have really seen this Bill exercised, but there is a scenario where you could have it a lot, say, less than five acres, four acres, in this case study, and that the board develop that site with nine lots with nine units on a very small portion of that larger lot. Say he took an acre of it, built nine units and nine lots, and the tenth lot was a much larger lot, which is the, the, the remaining three acres. They then complete the project, and now they have a new three-acre lot. They then apply for 684 for that remaining three-acre lot, and they build a new nine-lot subdivision with a two-acre remaining parcel. That, that's a, a possible application of the law, because I, I don't know to what extent it contemplates piecemealing or progressively adding. We'll have to look into that more as far as our, our formal, like when we're working the urgency ordinance, as well as our 
are uh, absolutely as part of the formal adoption of permanent standards. The intent of us right now is to get on the book something. So we don't really understand what the intent of the, the law is in terms of what they were figuring was going to happen as a result of this. Well, I, I think that insofar that the law provides for that to occur without any clear limitation to prevent for it, generally speaking, most of these laws are meant to be read in the bet betterment and favoring of the creation of more housing. So as far as the legislative intent, if that is a result, which would could result in more housing units, I'm inclined to believe that that would have been the intent of the state legislature and likely how ACD would favorably land on it as well as they have on past legislative updates. Whenever there's, a, there's ambiguity, they always try to land more favorably in, in, in terms of unit produ production. Uh, just because we do have the map up here on screen and just kind of clarify kind of an oddity of why the parcels which have been selected are shown. It, although we say any multifamily zone, you do see on the map here, mixed use properties, properties of mixed use land use designation because they do constitute a type of multifamily zone and it allows for multifamily. And then lots of densities much higher than what you typically think that would be included. Like we have some sites which are like transit oriented mixed use, 57 units the acre. So you're thinking just 10 units is the applicability of this law. And it says on the next slide, we're saying may result in 30 units to the acre, but it also provides for in situations where you're a designated housing opportunity site or not a designated site, the maximum allowable density out planned for, for the site as well. So it doesn't mean that you have to fall under 30 units per acre either. It just means that you either have to kind of comply with your general plan plan. You says, Designation when you're doing this project, or 30 units the acre. It's kind of an interesting combination. Now, granted, for those largest sites, like going back to the map here, if you were a transported site, 57 units the acre, in order to hit that, you'd have to have a very small lot. Like you're talking like a 6,000 square foot lot, you're chopping up into those 600 square foot parcel sizes. But if that were to happen, that's actually at that density range. So you could develop even a transit oriented site, one of our highest density designations of the city where we're contemplating those big towers with SB 684. So, so, so you're saying when a 6,000 square foot plot using 684, they would possibly build it, even though that is more than 30 units to the acre? Mm -hmm. Correct. <laughs> the law only provides that you may build um, up less than equal to 30 years per, per acre. And then it provides a separate section, which is dealing with circumstances where you are designated or not a designated house after Can I ask a question? Sure. Thank you. So I just wanted some clarification on the affordable, um, affordable units so far. So at this hour, if tomorrow morning you get to your desk and there's an application on your desk, you know, let's say they want to build nine units. There's no affordable requirements because it's less than 10. Accepting in circumstances where it is a designated housing opportunity site, in which case then the affordability requirement imposed on the parcel is that which had been projected as part of the housing. But otherwise, the city's inclusionary ordinance would not apply. Would not apply. Now, um, come, come your uh, urgency ordinance, the, the urgency ordinance for 684, could that change the affordable requirement? And to impose an inclusionary requirement on less than? It, it could. It absolutely could. And what, but the effective date of that is when, like how some people put the application in and it was before this uh, MFTDS went into effect, they grandfathered and they said, this doesn't apply to us because our application was put in before. As an urgency ordinance, it would go into effect immediately. <clears throat> so, so there wouldn't be the typical 30 days after second reading type delay like we experienced with the MFTDS. So it'd be in, in, in enforcement effect immediately. Correct. Okay. Now, I, I would also mention here that in order for the city to do such a to, to impose such a inclusionary requirement 
it would need to do so across the board because it is incongruent with the law to impose a standard specifically to a project due to its exercise of SB 684. So you would have to apply it citywide as part of the urgency ordinance as well, which would certainly expand the effectiveness of the urgency ordinance. Which, which, is, which is probably not like the time for this case. It, does, it definitely changes the stakeholders involved. Yeah, you know, I guess my, my, my macro question, Steve, and I kind of want to get ahead of ourselves. I know we can't talk about these specific projects, but do we have, right now, do we have projects pretty far along in the discussion phase in which these new laws will have significant uh, impact? Great question. I, I would say, I think the development community, by and large, as well as the planning Community across the state of California is still catching They're up. Still catching up. The speed. We are informing our development community of this law when they do come in and they appear to be presented with challenges, which this law would seemingly benefit from the, the exercise thereof. I could think of one project which could be pursuing this in the near term in Campbell. 684. 684. That, 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 they, that they've spoken with the planning staff, planning staff already about possible use of it. Anybody else? Questions? I have a discussion point that I don't think any questions. Yeah. Well, it's it's just, this is just a study session, so. Oh. Right? right? So we're just studying. <laughs> yeah, the thing I would say was, it looks like the, city, the, uh, the state is in ways that perhaps the state can't really work the law. Mm -hmm. I'm taking away our discretion. You give at the last meeting where I said that if we have even the slightest bit of discretion, that cities, including some like this city, will exploit that in ways that the city did not say that we would. I kind of get where the state's coming from. Like, you know, the, this kind of discretion is so often misused and I can see why the decision was made even though it, it seems like the the bankers home city um, just seems to come out of nowhere. But the same uh, the same subject, like that's how CEQA got so large. A series of court decisions which hold things that uh, were nowhere in the law out of it. I think originally it applied to like major actions by the government or something like that. You just had to write a whole report it ballooned into the foundation of modern environmental law because that was a, a thing that activists, lawyers, and judges wanted. Like, see where they come, came from on this. There's a, a perceived problem and that discretion is exploited. And so just getting rid of that discretion because of uh, how it's been misused. How to get it. <laughs> You know, I, I just on that point, I would say that there's no no doubt that that's uh, taking away states trying to take away a lot of the discretion from local authorities because you know it has there's, this housing crisis has been going on for a couple of decades now and locally that didn't happen so the state kind of has provided a lot of political cover for local folks but but then you go then you go do you go too far and. Uh, you know, the, I think we all agree the need for the housing, market rate housing, market rate housing, huge crisis, and we got to get going. And cities just haven't done it. Now the state's taken the initiative. Uh, but they're, you know, but, and then they go into some things that, you know, it's just not great planning. I mean, you know, we all, when we say, hey, no, no parking required. Oh my God, we were all worried. But they're, you know, the developers want to have a project that works. So, we haven't really gotten too many projects with no parking yet. And that's why I look at the setback thing. I, you know, I, I read Kurt Stevens' uh, presentation and read our report. Uh, you know, setbacks, just common sense, good planning type stuff. And you could take that away. And, oh, my God, you know, Jesus, is going too far. But but then, you know, when push comes to shove and reality happens, will that be a big issue? I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, well, I, yeah, I'd like to see one of our religious institutes. I know one of our religious institutions that's come up has been talking about a 100% affordable project 
So I'd like to see them go, you know, 200% affordable and not have any setbacks with their neighbors and take out every protected tree. Don't have any parking there. And let's see how that goes. You know, then I think, and I think Campbell would be leading the way on the, on the legis on the legal yeah, well, issue. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it turns out, I mean, I, I don't know all the churches in town, but, but there's a number of places that have more open space than, you know, other other places, no, right? No, no. It's, it's some of the fewer places. It's Those are some of the fewer places, places where they have, you know, whether it's like St. Lucie's or the church off of Llewellyn. I mean, there's these big open yeah, areas just, that they have that are uh, being left unused. Those are good so, places I mean, it, it, it yeah. makes perfect sense that no, no, they no, can no. swing um, putting in uh, uh, affordable, you know, and since it would be 100% affordable oh, housing, oh, it's, it's a, to me, it's a great great solution. You know? Oh, sure. You know, if if those things can be so, so I have I have no problem with that kind of incentive to, yeah. to do that kind of thing. Whether or not it, it will happen is, is a better thing. You know, I mean, I I drive by the the home home churches our parking lot almost every day. So it's like wow. It's a big yeah, I, I guess I was, it, it's usually not filled. You know, I mean, it's, no, it's I, not I, used up. I think so. yeah, for sure. There's some great sites there for, so, for affordable so projects. Those, I'm those, just trying to those, say that the worst case scenario probably in reality is not going to happen too often, and if it does, and, and the higher education thing is 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 like college, university. We, we don't have that issue. Right. So, um, as far you, you know, I uh, agree with Commissioner Cray in that sense that we experienced this very same exact phenomenon with SB nine. When it first came, it's like, oh my God, or, or you know, uh, our neighbor, here goes the neighborhood, they're going to replace every house with four units, and and it hasn't happened, you know, because there's so many other factors involved that we're not, uh, we're not considering or we're not talking about. You know? And so, um, as a practicing civil engineer, I get tons of calls from people who want to do this B9, and once they understand all the regulations involved, that doesn't make sense for me. It's, they never started. So, um, so the same thing with this one. I think that the uh, the extreme case we can talk about it, but it's not reality. You know, that's you know hardly ever happens. Um, well, I mean, you know, to to, to Mr. Gray's point. Uh, or to Commissioner Bookbender's point, it's like you see, you still see the pushback from residents, you know, on any development, <laughs> you know, whether it's the, the mobile home users uh, next to the the you know the tech center property, or whether it's like uh, you know uh, the San Jose project that's the Cambrian Plaza, you know, which is a, a massive redevelopment and. You know, adjacent, you know, they're, they're worried about traffic and, and all that stuff. And it's like, well, but that's going to have senior housing, affordable housing, commercial, a hotel. It's going to be, you know, and then people, people don't want change, right? The, the, the folks in the Cambrian area don't want, don't want, uh, you know, they already got a lot of traffic on Camden. And, and, and I, I get it, you know, but, but, you know, every time there's something comes up, you know, it's there's there's always pushback, and even when it doesn't make, it's 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 not, it's not even reasonable. You know, I mean, I, I see that next door all the time. It's like, like oh, they're going to put up this new thing here. It's like, well, you know, it's, it's in a previous commercial spot. It's really not going to affect the neighborhood that much. So, I, I all I would like to know is sometimes with some of these things that come out, like SB six eighty four. Uh, you know, things, what was the rationale? What was who was writing this up for what reason? And and what was the thinking behind it? It's, it's it's obviously it's it's not somebody from Campbell, it's probably somebody from San Francisco or somebody from San Diego or something that you know has a has a constituency and this is what they want to see done and, and they get agreement on it. But so it always, to me, it's always, it would be always good to kind of see behind what what's behind that. I mean, some of the stuff that we've seen early was makes perfect sense, you know, in terms of, you know, some lots of good stuff, SB9, things like that, where it makes reason. 
the the question always is if is 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 this going to practically happen? And then if you know, I'm not going to be around 20 or 30 years from now, whether 20 or 30 years now, people are going to regret it. You know, <laughs> or 40 years from now. Well, but, one big factor is if you have a mortgage on your house and you want to split your lot, bank may not be happy to say you've got to do that. They do. I don't want my sort out to fall. But 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 in regard to your question, how did this come about? One of the pieces of uh, uh, literature that I read was 684 is the counter, not the counter, but the um, comparable um, to SB9. SB9 applied to single family, this applies to multifamily. Yes, that's how, that's one way that they explain, you know, because people said, hey, I don't have a single family, how about me, you know, okay, there's something that can apply to your situation. Any more comments, questions? We wrap this up. All right. We don't have to, uh, there's no resolution for this. It's, it was just, that's just, that's just a state session. session. It's just, it's, 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 oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, as always, Stephen, I think you did a great job. Yeah, that's, that's a lot to digest. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Good luck. All right. And, and, and Daniel's sick. Is Daniel sick? Okay, well, we hope it gets better. Okay, I, I'm going to adjourn, right? Till um, there's. Uh, oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. Any uh, report? Uh, report from the uh, from the director. I'm sorry. Stay in the way of you and enjoy the rest of your evening. That's all right. A few quick notes. I'll make it quick. Uh, American Planning Association has an annual conference. I think one or two of you have gone to this. Uh, this year, September 28th, Riverside. The reason I'm bringing up now is we're trying to balance some budget issues and there's some interest from the planning commission but let's sign you up in the next month some portions of this year's budget so don't have to memorize all that and i will send you a reminder and just ask you to get back to us in the next few weeks sign up for one uh number two anyone who went to the lee training and against yeah yeah, just remember second year receipts if you want to get reimbursed. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to remember that. But fiscal year ends pretty soon, so just basically exit. Number three, I don't think I uh, pushed this out of the commission. So happy to report uh, the city of Campbell's planning division has been awarded by the American Planning Association, Northern California section, which includes over 100 cities, with a uh, award of excellence. Wow. Which means it's basically like the best planning agency. Nice. Not, not that they all apply for it, but you would only get this award of excellence if you merit high quality uh, planning products. So, Are we the only ones or were we, uh, were there a few others? I don't have an answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> I say it was competitive. I've been on the jury for these. They don't bring these out like candy. Uh, the award of excellence is something to be acknowledged. Congratulations. Congrats. Congrats. For a state award, uh, Senior Planner Stephen Rose is helping out with that. And Michelle Slug, if you go to the Paul APA conference, who knows? You might see it. <laughs> uh, number four, just a, a heads up. Uh, there'll be a training on an act called the Levine Act uh, that's coming up, and our city clerks coordinated this. Uh, the best understanding it has to do with political contributions related that could be made um, and related to items that might be coming before the planning commission. A lot having to do with financial disclosures and form setting up. Bill might have more to say about it, but the head, heads up is that the city clerk will be organizing a training setting it by itself. Uh, two last points. One is a uh, happy report. Uh, we hired a plan check examiner in our building department. So uh, this position on just helping projects through or the building official or senior inspectors had to do this. That takes away from a lot of the work. So someone who's just dedicated to this. Super bright individual we heard from City of Sacramento, our name is Serbia. So we should see a lot more efficiencies. You know, folks going through our process. And we're going through final interviews to hire an unhoused coordinator. So this is funded by three-year grant from Destination Home. It will help with their homes. Uh, last but not least, one report, if you remember the ropes and homes still in projects, did go to council last meeting was approved. Uh, 
there's no press piece about this. We'll see as a spotlight. We'll look at it. Um, and that's it. Oh, the very, very last one. I always get asked about the status of the crest of the project. Yes. Asked four times a week. So uh, the developer called me personally and said, I want to let you know that we're absolutely going forward. We're getting ready to pull permits. We're doing our traffic management plan now. So uh, I always wait until the permits are actually pulled. Because <laughs> they are going forward. So we should start this activity in the next few months on that site. Thanks. But that's all. Right. Uh, one question. Um, when will we be seeing some policy work? Policy work. Policy work. Okay. Uh, you mean like legislative actions coming yeah, up for you? Yeah. Well, the one uh, coming on the horizon you'll see in the next few months is our modifications to the inclusionary housing ordinance and commercial linkage fee. So. Uh, we had gone to the, this is on part of the housing development keyword plan, establishing commercial linkage fees. You have a new commercial building, there's a fee you would pay for, we would go into our housing program to stand up housing to support workers. So the city council did some initial review of options, gave uh, feedback to go forward with a certain fee we identified. It's a low fee, it's about $9 a square foot. So we're working on that. And then we're doing some modifications to inclusionary housing ordinance based on council direction. Right now, you have to be 10 units or over to be inclusionary housing. Uh, city Council generally agreed with some, some follow-ups to drop that down to the five range. We had some questions on what it sign me the lower density projects. Let's research on that. So to answer your question, Commissioner Buckbinder, uh, those ordinances, I think, were May, probably June, July time frame. We'll be coming back to that. Excellent. Uh, so in follow-up to that, is in Luffy, a possibility. It is, yeah. If they were to lower the threshold, because yeah. many smaller projects, they see that requirement, they you know, walk away. But yeah. if there's an in-loo fee, that's... We, we identified two categories for in-loo fee, because we wanted to balance getting units, money, and we like that both. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so one is small projects in the five to six range. You could pay an in-loo fee. Uh, so that's one option. And two... There's areas where today, let's say the calculation is you have to provide 10.2 inclusionary housing units. The two is it just sort of washes away under today's campus ordinance. You provide 10 units minimum. But we're proposing for that fraction, since there's an excess, that they would they could pay a fee for that point two and I think get some money into the group. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Else, anything else? Nope. All right. We adjourn to eight twenty-eight. <laughs> oh. Oh.